it is a great pleasure for me to be able to introduce Mother Jones, because I am one of those people who was one of the original um, ones who subscribed to the magazine 28 years ago. I hope you all got a copy of the magazine. Um, I heard people say that they hadn't heard of it before, so you definitely have to take a look at the magazine. And I am introducing Jay Harris, who is the publisher of Mother Jones. And during his tenure, the organization has built on its long tradition of groundbreaking public interest reporting. It's really revolutionary reporting. But they have also grown the circulation to unprecedented levels. You know, most magazines have niche markets these days, but actually, by 2003, paid circulation of the magazine had reached a quarter of a million, which is really remarkable. They also are a leader in what is called the thought leader category of magazines. And in 2001, Mother Jones was awarded the National Magazine Award for General Excellence. And it was his fourth such award. Now, believing that Mother Jones' investigative content and its 28-year-old brand have importance and audience potential beyond the print media, they did launch a website in 1993, which was well before the rest of us did. And it has become a very popular website, and there are, are stories on the site that are not in the magazine. But they have negotiated deals also to supply Mother Jones material to both Inside Edition, PBS's Frontline, and the first hour-long documentary from Mother Jones Television, Easy Money, a report on gambling, money, and politics. I guess there's all kinds of money in politics. Jay is vice chair of the Independent Press Association, and he's on the steering committee of the Magazine Publishers of America Independent Magazine Advisory Group. And he recently joined the board of advisors of Free Speech TV, so you can tell kind of where his politics lean. He's also a frequent radio and television guest appearing on Talk of the Nation, C-SPAN, and many other programs, and has been a featured speaker at conferences of the Social Ventures Network, Greenfest, Bioneers, yes, that's pioneers with a B, and businesses for social responsibility. He also, in his spare time, has taught magazine management at the University of California Graduate School of Journalism, and his essay on the state of the news business, What's Missing from Your News, was published in the Business of Journalism in 2000. I'd like to welcome Jay Harris to Massachusetts. Susan, Susan definitely got the long form of my biography there. I thank you very much for the nice words, and uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. It's uh, as a as a long suffering fan of the San Francisco Giants, I would be remiss if I did not if I came to Boston and did not congratulate the people of Boston on the World Series victory. Now there are only two franchises. There are only two franchises in the baseball world that have gone longer than the Giants without a championship, but uh, our turn is coming. I just hope it doesn't take, just hope it doesn't take 36 more years. Uh, as the publisher of Mother Jones, I'm extremely proud to be able to introduce Seymour Hersh tonight. Uh, there is a rich tradition in this country of investigative reporting. I think in some respects it's a, an undervalued, uh, un relatively... Um, unknown tradition, uh, but there's been so many turning points in our history that have been reached because a tenacious and brave reporter fueled by outrage at some abuse of power has walked either through literal or metaphorical fire to get out the truth to the rest of us. It's a tradition that Mother Jones is proud to be part of. With every issue, we try to live up to the legacy of Ida Tarbell and Upton Sinclair, Carrie McWilliams and I.F. Stone, and Seymour Hersh. Cy Hirsch has been breaking tide-turning stories since the late 1960s. His expose of the Malai Massacre in Vietnam was published in 1969. That story was released after turndowns from several mainstream magazines by the lefty Dispatch News Service. He was picked up initially by 34 newspapers who paid $100 each for the story. Many of you will remember the emotions associated with those revelations of what American soldiers were capable of doing in a war to spread democracy. Some of the most important investigative stories of the last 35 years are associated with Sai's name, the CIA's role in the Allende coup in Chile, domestic spying by the CIA resulting ultimately 
in the Church Commission report. A brilliant biography of Henry Kissinger's years in the Nixon White House. The destruction of Korean Airlines Flight 007. Mobile Oil's shady dealings in Kazakhstan. More recently, the cooking of pre-war intelligence on Iraq by a special unit in the Pentagon that stovepiped intelli the cooked intelligence up to the Vice President. And sadly, but significantly, the revelations of torture and abuse at Abu Ghraib. Richard Reeves says, Cy Hirsch has to be the great reporter of his generation. He's simply gotten stories that no one else could. He's the real thing, a legend, and he deserves to be. I'm pleased to introduce Cy Hirsch. Let's get down with it. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, uh, we're all scared. And we, maybe you all should be in New Hampshire, but that's why we're here. It, it is ironic that um, uh, we're, this is the last weekend, and over this last weekend, the Democrats are busy trying to get out the vote, and the Republicans are busy trying to keep it in. It is sort of amazing. But, you know, we're used to a lot of amazing things. I'm just going to tell you a little bit what I think where we're at. It's not going to make anybody happy. I guess I, I'll, I'll do the... Uh, um, there, is, there is a very relevant bit. If some of you might remember Richard Pryor. Uh, the late comedian who was so much on the edge. He has a bit where he's in, in his in home in, in his bed doing his wife's best friend and she walks in and starts shrieking and he starts saying, no, no, it, it isn't happening. What you think is happening isn't happening. And then he eventually says, listen, are you going to believe me or your lying eyes? <laughs> and so George Bush every day says the war is going well he's telling everybody on, on on the campaign trail and we all can see with our lying eyes every night on television or read in the newspaper that it's not going very well so he's put us in the same position and the reality is that let's not worry about we can't none of us know what's going to happen tuesday but let's just let's just take the horrible suck it, suck it up and say bush wins what does this mean well we got to deal with it folks Here's, here's what I think it means, and this is, this is the relevant message that, that I want to, we can, and also I hope we can do questions, and I hope everybody can hear me. Can you, if some can't, please let me know. I hear the sound isn't great here. So do holler. Um, a woman the other day, I was doing something in New York, and, and a very nice lady at, at a table of some benefit sent me a note, and she told me that she had gone to hear me at a Unitarian church somewhere a, a month earlier and hadn't heard a word I said. <laughs> so do, do let me know. Here's the issue about Bush. Um, he's got one option. Um, I've watched, I've been doing what I guess you could call an alternative history of the war since the war began. I'm long of tooth. I've been around Washington. I know a lot of people. And um, I'm sort of, I do have contacts. And um, I have also an innate respect. Um, I think all of us should understand there are an awful lot of very good people in the CIA and the FBI and in our military, people who care as much about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights as anybody here. And particularly some of them have a special worry because they have such importance. And I can tell you that on September the 12th and, and the 13th, I got two emails, one each day, one from somebody in the military who said to me, and I have private relations with people, and sometimes it's complicated, but who said that these people want to go to Iraq, and the other one was from somebody very high in the, in the security business who expressed all kinds of grave doubts about Ashcroft. And so very early, people could see signs after 9-11. Bush, Bush has done something very interesting in the last three months that nobody's really focused very much on. He's escalated the air war exponentially. We are not getting... I think the press has done a much better job in the last few months for all of the problems, and we all have them. I hear about it all the time, particularly from anybody who, who wants Kerry to win. There's a sense of enormous disillusionment with the networks and the major newspapers about the inability before the war to convey exactly what the reality was. We all accept that, but they're doing better now. Nonetheless, since we installed what I consider to be the use of Cold War term, the puppet government of Iyadalawi, who has absolutely no standing, our prime minister, Bush is keeping him in office with force because 
in case anybody has any doubt, the war is over. We've lost it. It's gone. This is an insurgency. There are people running the insurgency. There are people in charge. It's not just an insurgency in the Sunni Triangle. It's from north to south and from east to west. They're talking. They're in communication with each other. The, the, in a nutshell, the simple way to describe it is the problem we have for the next president, no matter who he is, is really simple. The 200 octane fuel, the jet fuel that drives the insurgency is us. And we're going to have to change the nomenclature no matter if, if Kerry's elected, his problem is going to be immense. He's going to have to figure some way to extract us from this mess. It's going to be very difficult. If Bush gets in, and which is totally not impossible if he's reelected, the bombing, what happened is, um, I think every month, if we were to get the sorties, in the Vietnam War, in, in the war in Yugoslavia, every day the Pentagon would announce these many sorties, the many, this many tons, tons of bombs drop. We're not getting any of that. Nobody's asking for it, and we're not getting it. But anecdotally, you know, bombing, 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 bombing. There's no anti-air defense. There's no air defense, period, in, in Iraq. There's no, there's no opposition. It's just what they, you know, it's just going, dropping bombs on suspected targets. I get emails from friends inside. Um, there are parts of uh, downtown uh, Sadr City, the, the Shiite stronghold in, in Baghdad, which is basically a, a complete cowboy in Indy land, um, where they, they bomb at noon, they bomb at five, they bomb overnight, almost continually. It's just bombing, bombing, bombing. I, I don't know. I can't give you an example. I can tell you that I, we don't even know where they're bombing from. We know Marines are involved. We know there's some flying from Doha. We have Army Bay, Air Force bases there. We know some carriers are involved. We don't have any idea. So. Bush, at, as virtuous as I think I am, I'm the guy, I got this great applause, I'm the guy that's fighting, you know, uh, uh, trying to, doing, as I say, the alternative history, and I really, I go to bed smelling of, you know, of, of lamb and sweet, whatever you count, sheep. As virtuous as I think I am, you have to understand that George Bush thinks he is too. Bush, I'm telling you, this is going to be, he didn't go to oil primarily for uh, didn't go to war primarily for oil or for Israel. Not that they're not important considerations. This is a war of ideology. This is the president who somehow has bought into what we call neoconservatism, which in simply, it's been, as Gene Kirkpatrick and others would articulate it back 30 years ago, it's the notion that we've got to instill democracy. Um, around the world. Then the, the target was the Soviet Union and its satellites. There's also an intellectual imprimatur that many know about going back to fights with Burnham and Shockman and the Progressive and the, the Socialist Workers Party. But basically, it's the basic way to look at neoconservatives is, is that they think after the first Gulf War it was a terrible mistake made. The solution to the, to the Middle East, the solution for Israel, more, more outspoken then, um, in the 90s, this is after the Gulf War and after the first war, George Bush's father fought and did not go to Baghdad. There was a growing hardcore right-wing group that said, Baghdad, Baghdad, Baghdad. That's the answer. I don't know how Bush got sold. He's a realist. Um, so is Cheney. So is Rumsfeld. This is, he's not Richard Pearl in terms of ideology. He's not Wilfowitz. He's not um, some of the names you might know. Newt Gingrich is also one of these. Basically, I think what, what in a nutshell, eight or nine neoconservatives, I'd call them a cult, have taken over the government. And the real question we have to ask ourselves, the ultimate question we have to ask ourselves, they did it without much murmurs from the military, from the Congress, from the bureaucracy, and from the press. And we have to say to ourselves really profoundly, how fragile is our democracy that this can happen so easily, that we've been taken over by these people who expressed such a very small, narrow view and it became the policy. In any case, Bush went to war because he believes that he, his mission in life, whether it's because of a crusade, whether it's because of a religious background, his mission in life is to make Iraq a democracy. And the way, all during 2002, the way I got into this as a reporter, is I know the guys on the inside. Good guys, loyal to the president. Loyal to the presidency is loyal. The notion of civilian control is, is, is absolutely overwhelmingly important into our military, and there's no challenging of that. And so the war begins. Bush announces, 9-11 happened, Bush announces that you're either for us or against us. You remember those wonderful statements. He attacks Afghanistan. By early 2002, publicly, we're, we're told it was a victory. Privately on the inside, guys are worried sick. The Taliban clearly were not defeated, despite the fact we said they were. They retreated, as, by the way, Afghan countries, you know, the British learned in the 19th century twice that, you know, what looks like victory isn't. Similarly, 
um, Al Qaeda had not been destroyed. Osama bin Laden was still around. We never was clear where Musharraf of Pakistan was. Was he with us or against us? It's still not clear. It's you know it's uh, it's always been a gray area. Is he is he spreading nuclear weapons as AQ Khan did, et cetera, et cetera? But in early 2002, Bush began to do something that disturbed everybody in the inside. By February and March, he began ordering, or at least units were ordered. We had some very sophisticated, honorable, decent special forces units in which people knew some Arabic. They were moved from the Afghan war into the Middle East, a sort of a staging area. The British had some special forces too with ex-good language skills. They were moved. So it was very clear early on to people on the inside, Iraq was coming. And the issue quickly became this. If you believed that the road, the path, the road to stopping international terrorism led to Baghdad, if you believed in that in the early 2002, at a time when the Afghan war was not going well, as I said, not going well at all, everybody's very nervous about it on the inside, if you believed that we had to go to Baghdad, you were a genius to Bush, Cheney, others. If you were somebody on the inside, a three-star general in the Joint Chiefs of Staff, or one of, one of the staff aides, or a senior guy in the CIA, or a senior guy in the State Department who'd spent your career telling the leadership what they think, what you, you're giving them your best advice, doing the honorable thing as an officer, saying what you think about any condition. And if you, at that point, in early 2002, in the spring of 2002, wrote memos saying, this is crazy, you cannot divert these resources. You cannot take the war somewhere else where right now there's no connection between Saddam and terrorism, etc. All those divides, all those issues you hear. You were not just treated as somebody who was in loyal opposition. You were a, a, a virtual traitor to the cause. You were somebody who, who had, was a disaffected person. You were exercised. You were actually written off. It, and the way it happened is, in the planopy of, of people in the bureaucracy, those who supported the war and s said so got ahead. They got the promotion. They got, more importantly, they got face time. They got time with Condoleezza Rice or with the principals, the senior leadership, or with Donald Rumsfeld. Those who objected slowly whittled away in terms of influences. And this was profound. This is one of the reasons people like me began to learn more and more and more about it. Bush, the big debate in 2002, was this. The neoconservatives were convinced, and this went on, this went on until the war, they were convinced that we didn't need the, the 250,000 the Marines were insisting for. The Marines were absolutely, the Marines are sort of interesting because they're gung-ho. They were going to kill. We sent them into Fallujah, which uh, I can't rule out an invasion of a Fallujah Sunday. I think it would be good politically. Nobody can rule it out. There's a lot of people, I can tell you, very sophisticated I was talking with today who think this might happen. I can just speculate. If he does go invade Fallujah, it'll probably be a plus for Bush. It'll make a lot of people who don't want to vote against the president in a time of war vote. Don't rule it out. I can't predict it. I don't know. I just know serious people are worried about it. I hope he doesn't. Because, in any case, but the Marines will go in there and kill and be killed. And, but they also will fight like hell if they think it's wrong. They fought like hell. Here was the fight. The fight was that the neoconservatives, there was a um, um, believe that you could go into Iraq with 10 or 15,000 troops. That's all you needed. You need some special forces, a little bombing, a lot of American flags. Lay it down. That's, can I help you? Okay. Lay it down. I wish you wouldn't do that. Because it's done. Anyway, lay, <laughs> do it. Okay. Uh, you want to take another one? Go ahead. No, please. Thank you. Uh, and lay it down and, and um, go in and lay down the, um, and go in with 10 or 15,000 troops, lay down the flags, Saddam would leave, a new government would appear, although it was never clear inside where, who. The motto was, and I remember talking to people about it, the best guess was it was Milosevic. Milosevic had fallen a few years earlier and the government stayed intact. Um, and so maybe that was the model. I don't know what they were thinking. And democracy, I've been saying this since uh, in the last weeks in television, democracy would flow like water from a fountain. It would spread from Baghdad throughout Iran. They would become democratic. Syria would go democratic. Iran would become democratic. Um, what they call the neocons always called occupied Lebanon. They always hated the Syrian influence. There would be democratic. Saudis would go democratic. And therefore, the oil would be protected. Israel would be protected since the Palestinians would lose their allies and have to settle for, you know, wouldn't have any bargaining position. This was the thesis. And Bush, I am telling you, believes it. And therefore, he believes it 
hook, line, and sinker. And yes, it's idealistic. Yes, it's utopian. Uh, to use a phrase he would not use, but Paul Wolfowitz would, and I've been using, he's, it was Trotskyite in, in terms of being a believer in permanent revolution. Um, that isn't the way. Uh, Bush just saw it as this is his mantra. Therefore, if reelected, he is going to continue to bomb because that's the only option. He's going to continue to believe that, the only, that his mission is to win this war. And the only way he can win it is with force. And he is going to, he is prepared to accept more body bags, a thousand, two thousand, three thousand. We're not even talking about Iraqi casualties. Some of you may notice that Lancet, the British magazine, did a survey that estimated a hundred thousand Iraqi killed. I'd heard the number fifty thousand anecdotally from my friends on the inside. That's a working guess they had as of a few months ago. Enormous amount of civilian carnage. Um, Bush is not going to stop. He is simply committed. What does that mean? If reelected, um, uh, you know the cliche was in 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 the Vietnam War there was a famous moment at the end of the war when Peter Arnett, the Australian journalist working for the Associated Press, was interviewing a, uh, a, an artillery major, and they were throwing shells at a village, and you could see there was nothing there but women and children. And Arnett asked the reporter, uh, the re as a reporter asked the the major, "Why are you doing it?" He said, "Well, sir, we have to destroy the village in order to save it." So we may get to that. You know, I don't know how much time we have. I don't want to go too late for you guys. Let, let me tell you a little bit. You know, we always talk in this big macro. That's how we always talk in, you know, in the in campaigns and elections. We talk macro. We rarely talk micro. You know, the micro. When I did the Milai stuff, one of the lines that stuck in my head was, you know, Milai was, for those who don't know, our GIs went into a village in, in March of 1968. They were... They went and they executed every, they expected to see enemy, they hadn't, they'd been nickel dimed to death by mines and snipers and they lost 20% or 15% of their company without any combat contact. They finally had contact. Instead of the enemy, what they found was uh, 500, maybe 550 women, children and old men and they began executing them. It's a horrible story, it happened. And one of the ironies of it, about 80 men involved, about 40% were Hispanic and, uh, and black and they shot in the air. The white farm kids shot down a kid named Meadlow. One of the kids that did most of the shooting was named Paul Meadlow, a farm kid, and he shot it up, shot and shot and shot. And the next day he had his leg blown off. And somebody may remember the fall guy for this mission was Lieutenant William Kelly, a first lieutenant, a 90-day wonder. I'd been a rail railway switchman dragooned in the army, and he was the leader. And uh, as he was being medevaced away, he said, Cal Medlow's, Medlow's kept on saying, God has punished me, he's going to punish you. So I get to this story, as you heard in the introduction, as an a freelance. Not, not because I wanted to be, because no major newspaper would get it, but that's, you know, we've been there, done that. So I'm doing the story, and I hear about Medlow. He's in a town called New Goshen, Indiana, which is outside of Terre Haute, Indiana, which is outside of Indianapolis, Indiana, which is some of you guys on the coast, that's all what we call flyover, right? We go in New York. <laughs> so I get to this town, and I call his mother, and I go to, and I see his mother, and it's a chicken farm. This is, this is rural, lower class rural America. And she's a chicken farmer, there's no husband. She's out of, some of you might remember those Saturday Evening Post covers, Norman Rockwell, those little, you know, she's out of a Norman Rockwell painting. She's wizened, short, wrinkled beyond belief, heart, scrabble life, probably looked, she was 50 but looked 75, and she said, I'll let you talk to him. I had called earlier and told her what I wanted, and she wasn't, she was skeptical. And then she said to me, and when, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 30 years old, and she said to me, I gave them a good boy and they sent me back a murderer. Now flash forward 35 years. I'm doing Abu Ghraib. And I'm writing in, in this spring in the New Yorker, I write three pieces about Abu Ghraib. CBS had some photographs, but I had more photographs actually and, and a report by a major general named Antonio Taguba, born in the Philippines, an army major general. We should all thank God they're such good officers. His report is the only one that's been written about this event that wasn't meant to be published. Devastating. It began with the obvious. This started with Afghanistan. This started right away. This kind of abuse, and it's much more, much more of widespread. We can talk. You, you guys have the picture of a grave. You don't need me to talk more about it. But anyway, after I do those stories, in the middle of doing those stories, I get a call from uh, the same kind of an American, a, a woman, a mother, 
And she had a daughter in the unit, an MP daughter. She knew was a prison guard. This is in May of this May. And the daughter had come home in, in March of 2004, been rotated early, her MP unit. When she came home, um, she was totally different. She, was the, she had a husband. She left her husband. She left the family. She was despondent. She moved out. She lived by herself. And she wouldn't communicate with anybody. And on weekends, on her weekends, she would go and get horrible, horrible black tattoos all over her body. But black tattoos, and the mother didn't know what was going on. I think the word I would use is depressed. It's not a word that I guess, you know, in, there's no insurance for, you know, there's no, where do they go in, in a rural back, backwater? She was in an MP unit that was out of West Virginia. And this is part of the unit that produced the seven or eight villains that we now see every day. You know, the bad seeds, I call them. The Pentagon's, the Pentagon's won the public relations war in Abu Ghraib. Eight bad seeds did it. One guy just got eight years, and the public doesn't care very much occasionally. When I ended up writing about Milai, I ended up, when I learned more about who the kids were and what they were in that unit, I ended up concluding that the kids who did the murdering were as... Um, they were as innocent in as a way as the people they murdered. There was, you know, that they were as lost as the people they murdered. There was just no way I could really blame them for these incredibly stupid, murderous things they did. They had, they had been totally indoctrinated. And I ended up with sympathy for some of the kids, even though I knew they'd done heinous things. In this case, I had the same, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what I think. Let me keep on going. So, uh, after my Milai stories in the New Yorker, she goes to her daughter. And she says, were you in Abu Ghraib? I can't believe I didn't turn off my phone. I'm turning it off now. <laughs> Don't ever... Listen, it's okay. It, it, that's the worst thing I do. Even in the next ten minutes, I'll be happy. So anyway, she... Um, um, uh, after, after she goes to the daughter and she says to her daughter... Um, uh, were you there? And the daughter slams the door on her. And then she says, and I, she tells me she just did it as a matter of rote, but I do believe in the unconscious. I mean, Freud lives. She had given her daughter a laptop computer before she left for the war. Why? Because it had a DVD and the kid could play movies on it. This is something I didn't know about, but this is very common now. And the daughter had left the laptop home. And so she took the laptop home. She said she was simply cleaning out files, but she started going through it. There's a file marked Iraq, and out pops a hundred digital, is the right word, digital photographs of a man, naked, prisoner, terrified, leaning against the, uh, uh, a cell with two dogs in front of him. Remember that iconic dog photograph that the New Yorker published? I'll tell you what else she saw. The dog bit badly the man, and there was a lot of blood. It was a horrible set of photographs, and I, I don't know you mothers might get have some empathy for what this mother felt. And so, again, you say to yourself, uh, we really don't have a firm sense of, in America, it's still, as much as we know about war, it's even the people we think may be the most uh, vulgar and violent, there's always a lot, there's always many sides to every issue. And in the case of Abu Ghraib, the fact that the president is perfectly willing to let these seven or eight bad seeds be punished. This is a group of kids that operated for three to three and a half months every night uh, doing what they did. Is, uh, humiliating, sexually humiliating people, dressing them down, having them posed in homosexual positions. And what, what three and a half months, it was only stopped when one of their own and turned them in. And when we send our children to war, and the good officers here, some of you who served know what I'm talking about, the, the, the officers, they're, they're in local parentis. And it's not only to protect our children, our boys and girls, from stepping on mines or getting killed, but also to, there's nothing as dumb as an 18 or 20 year old kid with a weapon, to protect them for themselves. And the notion that there's not more distress over the fact that these people operated for three and a half months and only stopped, it only stopped when one of their own turned it in. And then what happened? The chronology is fascinating. It's done in January of this year, they're turned in. Rumsfeld, we now know from public opinions and public statements and investigations, not such as they are, that within a, a few weeks of the, of the investigation beginning, Rumsfeld was told about it, he told the president, and what happens next? Nada. 
Nothing till it becomes public. Does anybody say, my God, we've got to investigate this, we've got to do a major sweep, we've got to upgrade what we're doing in our prisons? For a lot of reasons, it's totally stupid. Uh, one is you never treat prisoners, their prisoners, any differently than you want your own prisoners to be treated. And two, it's a war of terrorism. It's a war of intelligence. You can't win it with bombs. You can't win it with force. You've got to, you've got to do interrogations in which you get people to turn. You've got to get people to give you information. Coercion doesn't do it with people who are willing to fly airplanes into your buildings. You can only do it by establishing rapport. This isn't me. This is the experts I've talked to in the community. All of this is like another world for the people in the White House. It's a sense, an area of sensibility that doesn't exist. If Bush wins, he will continue bombing. Europe will go crazy. Europe, the Europeans are rattled to death. It's more than just not liking him personally. They are 35, 3,500 miles closer to this madness. For Europe, Iraq is a direct national security threat. They have Muslim minorities that are agitated. They, the last thing they want is a continuing festering insurgency and chaos and a lot more violence in that country. And Europe will do something about it. I think for the for Europe, I, I can't tell you. My guess is, my guess is Europe will do something uh, um, collaterally. They will join up in some fate. Maybe in the UN, maybe in the EU, the European Union. But they will join. The Germans and the French will lobby. Certainly, the, the people in Brussels and the Netherlands. Some they will lobby countries to get together and serve as a block against us. In case you haven't been paying attention, American business overseas is dwindling very seriously. Some of you have seen it. There's been more and more reporting on it just in the last week. It's been going on for months. America, they are turning away from us, the Europeans. We do an awful lot of business overseas. It's a very serious long-term economic issue. And something else I think you have to anticipate, and that is Europe is going to say, and how do I know this? I've talked to foreign leaders. I, I, it's, this, is, this is, I've talked to the foreign ministers and the intelligence people, that's what I do for a living. I, I do have tremendous access, particularly over there, but here too with people, because it's, this is serious stuff and people are very worried. Europe is no longer going to let the United States be the sole interlocutor between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Schroeder has an election this year in Germany. If Schroeder he gets, a, he's winning against a conservative woman, if he wins a good plurality, I think Germany might even lead the way into reevaluating. We've got to come to terms with some of the basic issues of terrorism. And Bush is not prepared to do it. He's simply not going to do it. So he's elected. We'll have an epiphany. I don't know what will happen. Um, um, it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's ugly. It's very depressing. He's not going to back off. Don't have any, any illusion that after the election he's going to announce that he's going to rethink his, his position on the war. His position is there. The only reason he and Cheney keep on saying everything's okay, because that's the only way they can deal with what they've done. Everything is okay. This is a blip. We will win the war. We will apply as much pressure as pressure. That's why it's so terrifying. There's nothing as frightening as an ideologue or an idealistic person who's completely dead wrong and there's no way to get to him. You cannot get to him. He is simply immured. He doesn't see it. He doesn't hear it. He doesn't want to know it. They have created a world of their own. And I don't... I, I just... You know, and the other thing that's going to be horrible... You know, I, 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 I promise I'm not selling uh, uppers on the side. <laughs> it's not my mission. Although if I went into it, I could do real well. <laughs> the other thing that's going to happen is this. Right now we get a little pass, we American citizens, because Europe says and the Middle East says, okay, you did this horrible act, uh, elected Bush. You, 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 didn't, you elected Bush, but you didn't know when you elected him that 9-11 was going to happen and he was going to take the war the way he did it into, the, uh, um, uh, uh, into Iraq and do what he does and uh, spray so much death and destruction around. You didn't know that. Um, but if we elect him, if he is elected, Europe will say, you guys have done, you guys have done it. We will, uh, I think the escalation will be huge, not only economically, but I think it will be much harder for many of us to travel. They've always made a distinction right now between us and the, pe the people and the government, and that's going to diminish. So I think we're going to be, uh, what am I saying? I guess what I'm saying to you is, Vietnam was awful. We lost 58,000, two to three million Iraq, uh, Vietnamese were killed, and it was always a tactical issue. Our national security was never at stake. 
um, because what, five years after the war, we're busy, you know, as I said earlier, playing Monopoly with them, building hotels, doing tourist business, the Vietnamese. It's a cultural thing. They, they open their doors to us, and we're in good relationship. Right now, right now, we are facing a strategic threat from the Middle East. I had an Israeli friend. Uh, I love the Israelis. They're great people. Uh, it makes me very sad. They've been treating Arabs like rocks for 50 years. And, it, you know, it's an unending consequences. They're both a, a, a pox on both houses. Although I must say this government's done nothing. And um, to uh, ameliorate the, the uh, deteri deteriorating relationships. But an Israeli friend of mine, a guy who knows Arabic beautifully and, and knows German and spent a lot of time crawling in the back alleys and crawling in Damascus and working for his intelligence service. And it's, there's other units besides Mossad in the Israeli community, just as there are other units besides our commandos. We have some very skilled private units, unknown units, that, that I, I'd like to think do, do, do help protect us and don't get involved in too much of the bad stuff. But in any case, this guy said to me after I did those articles, he called up and he said, you know, I hate Arabs. I've been killing them for 40 or 50 years. And, and they've been trying, they hate me and they're trying to kill me for 40 or 50 years. But I'll tell you one thing. At some point we all understand this, that we're going to have to live with those SOBs. And whether there's a wall there or not, we're going to have to share a border with them. And let me tell you, Hirsch, if we had treated our prisoners, not that Israelis can't be awfully nasty to certain individuals, but if we had treated our prisoners the way you treated your prisoners, your men in Abu Ghraib, that wouldn't be possible. We have dug a huge, huge hole. So, let's take the other side for one minute, and I'll get out of here. We can do questions. Kerry wins. Um, uh, one of the yeah, well... But he's got to win by a couple of points, or else we're locked into a lot of stuff. And um, but Kerry wins. One of the immediate problems he's going to have is that, of course, he has been saying, "I can win this," and I, I, we are. We're just as a, you know, we're just holding our nose and voting for him because you have to, and just hope, hope that he really doesn't mean what he says. Because he can't win this. He's, he said he's going to ask our allies to come. I, I, I can't imagine the French or the Germans deciding to change the nationality of the corpses. And he's going to increase the special forces. Our special forces are totally done. They've been cooking at a high rate. The tempo is enormous. We have 300 fuels, fewer SEALs at work right now, our Navy the commandos, than we did a year ago. They've simply melted away. They resign and quit. And, um, um, Basically, um, they can't sustain this. The SEALs, the Special Force community is really driven to the wall, very exhausted. He's going to improve, he says, the uh, Iraqi police and Iraqi army. Well, we've seen in the last few days that's a long shot. He's also going to tell, I love it, he's going to tell uh, Iranians he's going to be tougher than you are, Mr. President, he said in the third debate. We're going to tell Iran that you know, we won't tolerate this or that. And then Bush, of course, to make everything really hallucinatory, then denounces this guy as a liberal. <laughs> but having said that, you know, I, I hope fervently he wins. I hope you don't think it's going to be easy. And I'll tell you what we're going to have to do. And suck it up and listen to this. We're going to have to, we're going to have to deal with the insurgency to get out of here. And if I had said to you in 1966, in, during the Vietnam War, that we're going to have to deal with the Viet Cong, I would have been said, they would have said, forget it, we're not dealing with the Viet Cong, never, never, never. You know, by the way, Nixon, in 1968, some of the old timers remember, he campaigned and beat Humphrey by telling all of us that he had a secret plan to end the war, remember? And you know what it turned out to be? He was going to win it. <laughs> uh, but anyway... Um, I think we're going to have to, we're going to, in order to get out, we're going to have to deal with the people that run the country, and it is in Alawi. And that's an enormous step. How is he going to get there? We're going to have to change the nomenclature. I think one of the things he will do is have an international conference and start from there after inauguration if he wins. But it's going to be very difficult. It's going to not be a good time for all of us. It's going to be a very, there's no money. The budget crisis is much worse. Everybody assures me it's so much worse than you know. Um, and uh, it's hard times for us. We've been put into a situation where these people have come. You know, my parents were from the old country. They came where they emigrated here. And they came because Statue of Liberty, new start in life. They were escaping pogroms or what you will. And they came here because America meant, some, meant something. And America has always meant something, even with the disasters in Vietnam and the disasters with the, in Latin America under, under, under Reagan. We've always had 
there's always been a sense that we stand for morality and integrity and that we don't reinvent the rules, we don't change the rules of the Geneva Convention and other things to please us, you know, and these guys have really taken a big bite of the apple on that. They have really lowered our standing in very profound ways around the world. And so we have a huge collective problem um, to deal with. And that is, uh, I guess the first thing we have to do is accept it. That we are in, as I guess you could say, deep kimchi. We are in really a spot. We are, this man has put us there. This man, um, which I would say, and whatever his intentions, and I do believe he thinks he's doing the right thing, and that's all the more frightening. I wish I could make some of you happy and say, yes, it's really for oil. It would be so reassuring for me to know there was some outside motive for the madness. But it's not. It's about ideology. And if there's anything more frightening, as I said earlier, this is a guy um, that isn't going to be stopped. And maybe we can do it Tuesday, and maybe not. Um, I don't know what will happen. We'll have some sort of epiphany if he does keeps on going. Within a year, the country will be up in smoke. And you're going to see, you know, civil disobedience and disarray, and disarray that you've, you know, make what happened in Vietnam look uh, nickel dime. Well, on that, on that wonderful upbeat note, uh, it's what I think. Let's do questions. I hope somebody disagrees with me, but you know, let's do it in a way that. How do we want to do it? We don't need applause. Let's just forget it. There's nothing to clap at. Just get in your car tomorrow and go start campaigning. When you say here, well. No. To, uh, yeah, to ask questions, please queue up at the central microphone here. And we don't need to know who you are. You can be anonymous. You, you started answering my question in the last sentence. I was wondering what the domestic consequences would be. And I, was, I appreciate your views on Iraq and the international situation. But is it, it seems to me that uh, it, it's conceivable that the Iraq situation is a conscious desire to shift the domestic I mean this sounds really I guess uh, bizarre but the mess to shift the domestic uh, culture war it's really almost an invitation to what you suggested in your last sentence a civil war a rebellion a riot in other words bringing back the 60s but winning it this time in other words instead of the conservatives rolling over because of fear of the Bolshevik threat without the threat of Bolshevism the right wing might try to win the domestic uh, culture war so what do you think is say a little more about what would happen domestically if Ke Bush wins and it, even if Kerry wins but doesn't do any better well Kerry will do better I think because he'll be under pressure too but if, look if I could predict the future I'd spend my time at the track you know <laughs> but essentially I have to tell you one thing um, they've got the tanks buddy you know they have the tanks but um, you could be, I, I, I do think the possibilities of very serious uh, disarray are acute. And I don't mean to be alarmist, but I can tell you that the, there's, there's, there's a lot of anger in this country on both sides. And um, in one case, it's unfortunately, it's not informed anger. And I don't know how you correct that. Let's go on. It's, I mean, I, you know, I just don't know what to tell you, except that, you know, I, 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 I feel your pain. Yes. Um, I think while I agree that partially uh, the, the war actually is, is for ideology, but I think uh, the, main result, the main reason behind the war is actually Israel and Israel's security. I beg your pardon, say this again. I, I believe that the main reason behind the war is really Israel and Israeli security. And I think the reason why is because of Israeli lobbying here in the United okay. States, APEC lobbying. And, I, and that actually, I think Kerry is in the same camp. How do you think Kerry is going to act any differently when it comes to Palestinians well, and Israelis and, 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 okay. Iraq, and Iran for that matter? You know, I've learned something, which is in Washington, I've learned when it comes, you know, talking about Israel, and, and what's going to happen is, is made dinner in Washington almost impossible. Um, but, I, you know, it's just very hard. It's very tough because it's um, essentially uh, my thesis is, as important as Israel is, I think the overriding here, goal here, and certainly for many people, Pearl and perhaps Wolfowitz, Israel is very, very important in the equation, and maybe even for the president. I don't know that, but I can tell you right now, his overriding goal right now is to establish democracy 
in Iraq, and he believes that's the way to not only solve, as I said, protect the oil and solve the Israeli problem, but the first principle is establishing democracy, and that he'll go all the way for. Of course, Israel is Israel's basically made a bad bet. They supported this war and they're wrong, and they're now in a panic. And we'll see what happens. But I don't think it's, I just disagree with you slightly about what Bush's motives are, but you could be, well be right. I don't know. Yes, ma'am. Well, since you say that uh, the uh, Europeans are withholding buying from us, what, what do you think is going to happen to our economy? Is it going to look like Argentina? <laughs> <laughs> well, all, all I can say to you is that one of the pressure points will be, one of the things that happened, and one of the things about those horrible photographs of Abu Ghraib was, you know, uh, um, very, very few people in the Muslim world are terrorists. Most are middle class people, and the Muslim world traditionally um, has been very supportive of America in many ways. For all of the questions about our support for Israel, many Arab Muslims and, and Arabs send their children here, do business here. There's a, among the young people, there's a, been a growing, um, uh, uh, because of the internet and because of the cable television, there's been a growing appreciation for American uh, the, the youthfulness of America, the clothes, the music, the sports. Michael Jordan's a hero around the world. And so um, uh, all of that is going to diminish enormously, is diminishing right now. I, I don't know whether it's the models Argentina or not, but it's not good. And uh, if you've been listening, uh, some, of the major, some of the major car dealers are feeling it, Disney's feeling it. There's a lot of real, their new amusement park is almost denuded of people. It's, 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 it's going to be a real issue. And it's not a big issue now, but it is. We, we, we depend on foreign commerce an awful lot. So, uh, you know, Argentina, maybe? Yes, ma'am. I've been trying to understand um, what you've been saying about the mentality of the neoconservatives. And you've been calling this a war of ideology. And I believe that you mean something by that, but I want to figure out more what you mean. Because when you describe their ideology, it's not that different from mine, or I believe from anyone else's in this room. I mean, everybody thinks that people around the world should live under representative democracy. And so what's distinguishing the, the neoconservatives in government, it seems like, is a singular level of incompetence in carrying that out. And I don't know where that comes from. And then the second thing that doesn't jive with the war of ideology is the fact that they seem so uncommitted to basic democratic principles in the United States. And so, and yet they must be reconciling that cognitive dissonance somehow in their head, and I don't know how. And I don't know if you know how, but if you could explain something, that I would could, be great. I could make it more complicated. The same people that are talking about democracies being so valuable in, in, um, in Iraq don't seem to mind the lack of it in Saudi Arabia necessarily or in Egypt or any places around, if you really want to go at it. Um, but if you're talking about co cognitive dissidence, I, I, I can't resolve it for you. I can just tell you that the mantra of these people was, you have to go to Iraq. And we know that happened. And um, the best face you can put on it, look, I've spent a lot of time talking to these people. They really believe that Saddam somehow magically controlled terrorism. They believe it. It doesn't matter what the 9-11 Commission or what other people said. They believe he was, there was no way he couldn't have been involved with, with, um, with either 9-11 or with Al-Qaeda. And it doesn't matter what the reality is. They have their own reality. And that's what's so scary about them, that you can't get to them by saying, well, look at this report or look at this. And the way somebody described in the community, in the intelligence community, described the way they were. I'll get to you in one second, sir. In 2002, he described the White House in 2002 when it was desperate to make the case for the war in Iraq. And they knew they were way short of a case. They described them as a huge reverse vacuum that simply... Anything in the diaspora that suggested Saddam had some evil intent anywhere, they sucked in. And you heard the word stovepipe went directly, didn't go to the CIA or to the State Department for analysis. It went straight from the Pentagon into from Rumsfeld's office, into the pres into Cheney's office, into the president. Oh my God, Niger is uh, helping to sell nuclear materials, etc., etc. That's how those crazy stories originated. It defies, you're talking about dissonance, it defies rationality. And that's where we're at. And that's what's scary about it. Of course it's illogical. Of course, in principle, you're right about democracy, but democracy in a, in a part of the world where it's never been, and they don't know how to do it. Martin Luther King, I used to cover civil rights, and I had the great thrill of knowing him pretty well as a reporter. And just as a reporter, he once said very bitterly after a failed march, he said, freedom is really, really hard. 
to give to people who don't understand it and don't know what it means. And you have to first teach them what freedom is and show them. And so the idea that we could simply move in and set up a democratic government, it, it would so be naive. But it's terrifying. That's, to me, if you want my free advice, folks, those of you who could afford it, sell, sell short and go to Italy, buy some property. Go ahead. Yes, sir. I'm glad to see that you uh, basically admit that the uh, Israeli tail is wagging the American dog. No, I don't quite basically admit it, you know. But um, I think that uh, we don't go back far enough in history, at least as far as World War II, wherein the uh, Rothschild Bank supported both sides of World War II. And um, I've been trying to figure out what's been going on with that, and I figured out what happened is that they wanted to get the younger fighting age Jews out of Europe, so they used, financed the useful idiot who was Hitler. And well, well, used him. whoa, whoa, why don't, why don't we stick to Iraq? Give me your question. No, no this, is, this is history because Saddam is just the same as Hitler. This is a person they build up and then they come and say, oh, we need all these weapons to stop this bad guy. They don't say, oh, well, we've been building him up. So you can, it's an arms race. It's an arms race game okay. that's being played okay. and it's being replayed and replayed okay. and replayed. And the reason that, it, that, the, that the Rothschild Bank, the Khazar Rothschild Bank. No, please. Can we, no, no, this why is Why don't you see me later? Why don't you see me later? I don't want to shut you up, but I, we don't, we can, I'll be glad to talk to you about later. It's history repeating itself. Well, but I, I don't think you, I really think you, let, see me later, I'll be glad to talk to you when we're done. Why do you not want to face it in public? Well, because I think it's wacky. It's wacky. <laughs> no! Hi, Mr. Hirsch, first thing I'd like to say is thanks for coming to Boston and giving us the opportunity to hear you. And, uh, thanks. Thanks for your work all these years. Um, first, about, about Iraq and uh, Afghanistan, I think the neocons maybe, I don't want to give them credit because I don't think they did it intentionally, but they sort of brought the fight there rather than to another World Trade Center. Possibly. Um, possibly. Possibly. But my, my two questions, actually, I want to change tracks for a minute. I want to ask a little bit about your about how you do your craft and between Ashcroft, Rice and Tenet, I gotta figure you've got a tail on you 24 hours a day. And my second question is, do you, do you I know you don't want a horse bat, but do you really think there's enough cognitive dissonance? Have we reached an epidemic level of cognitive dissonance where Bush can actually win a fair election on Tuesday? No. I don't think he can win a fair election. But I, I, I don't know what he's gonna do. But it, it's so hard to predict. Let me just say this to you. Some of the you know, um, uh, the hardest thing, by the way, is under the Patriot Act, you should all know this, uh, any cell phone conversation between two people, most cell phone conversations bounce wherever there's a circuit, and often they bounce, you know, a call between two people can bounce to Spain and back or Sweden and back, and th those are ineceptible by the government. So there are some inherent issues. that the, the, the Patriot Act has a lot of small little footnotes to it that are very troubling that we don't know much about. Uh, largely because nobody wants to talk about it. But let me, about your question about 9-11. Let me tell you what some of the serious people that I know in the government, and, and uh, really smart, serious people who are very troubled working for this government. Talk to me, my friends talk to me, but I gotta get out. But you know, first of all, a lot of years invested, particularly if you're a two or three star officer and you wanna run a core, and, you, and, and you're, you're really motivated. You, 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 you love doing what you're doing. For many people, for many Marines, for example, um, uh, Marine Corps is, you know, they would have gone and, and become Jesuits, but, uh, but they couldn't get through the celibacy business, so they joined the Marine Corps. <laughs> um, you know, but smart guys said this to me after 9-11, that the real issue we have here is what happened. These 19 guys, the question is, were they dug in? Did Al-Qaeda come to America in 1997 or 98 and plant people inside in every major city? What, what, what is what happened? That was it the product of a very brilliantly done, long-term, uh, with long-term illegals and double agents, or were the 19 guys the equivalent of a pickup basketball team that got to the final four? That was the issue. They've concluded the latter, that Saddam is not here, that he's been on the run, and yes, there's no question that one of the things, I think it would have, I, I, I know Bush takes a lot of credit, but I assure you any president would have done anything he could to put uh, uh, bin Laden and Al-Qaeda on the run. So, but he's on the run, and, and, um, um, and their 
therefore, they're not suggesting that we're not we're immune from from terrorism. But the view of the smart guy was the smart guys would pain them the most is the White House p played the fear card, and they didn't have to. There was another way to do it, which is simply to say terrorism. It was horrible. It was awful. It happens. It's a it's a it's a function of modern society. The British have been living with it for with Ireland for 70, 90, 80 years. I, our French had it with Algeria. Terrorism is terrible. It's violent. It's it's but it is something that it's not going to defeat the United States of America. Instead, they really tried to change the country in ways that were very unattractive, and they also played the fear card. That's what they're playing right now in the campaign, and that's why they've got so many. They're holding that 48 percent so tight. Those soccer moms and all that. And that's a deliberate choice that strikes me as so inadequate. And history is going to be very cruel to these people. But the, the, the real issue is the pros do not believe Saddam has some secret mastermind play. What happened was largely because of enormous incompetence on our part. The, the airlines have been, have been, the airline lobby was so strong that any attempt in the last 10, 20 years to increase the security on airplanes, get a, a stronger a, a door for the pilots has always been beat back, beaten back by their lobby. Um, and, um, and so we've gotten smarter. Whether or not Homeland Security works or not, we're all smarter. If some of you saw those 9-11 photographs, those guys that, the, the, the four guys that, that did the plane, that took down the plane at Dulles Airport that went into the Pentagon, they had trouble getting through security. They didn't know English. They stood around. They staggered. And finally, the guard just said, go on. Not going to happen anymore. So we are better off. doesn't mean we're immune. And it doesn't mean something can happen tomorrow. But it certainly hasn't happened. And all the threats they've made have not proved, you know, and it doesn't mean that it's necessary because Bush has done a good job. It could be that they simply, they simply got to the final four. Anyway, but we don't know. We won't know that for a long time. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to hear your comments about a, an alternate uh, explanation that I have about what, the situation that we're in. Uh, and, and, it, and it has to do with the, the anomaly, I think, for, for the version that you've presented of, of a cabal of a, of a handful of neocons. The anomaly, the thing that doesn't fit, is that uh, when George Bush uh, tried to get Congress to go, you know, to accept his... Uh, you know, the, whatever the, the vote was, the resolution to go to war, and that during that whole period, there was plenty of evidence around from talk from the people at the CIA and so forth. New York Times, after the fact, you know, had an editorial where they recounted that at the time there was plenty of evidence that Bush was lying to the Congress about the weapons of mass destruction evidence and the tubes and the aluminum and the yellow cake and so on and so forth. And yet, the Democratic Party completely went along, gave him a green light, as did the entire uh, mass media. So that doesn't fit with the idea that it was a cabal of a handful of people, because had it been a cabal, then major powers in the United States, the mass media, all the corporations that own them, and the Democratic Party, uh, would have said, you know, would have, you know, done something more dramatic to say, wait a minute, this is, there's no evidence for this, there's no evidence for that, the, the, these are a cabal of, of people that shouldn't, that cannot be taken seriously by the American public, but they didn't do that, they did the opposite. So I would like to present why I think that is, which... Okay. Can I ask, which, which, which is question? that there, there is a very the, the 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 powerful people in this country, not just a cabal. One, go from Bill Moyers to to George Bush, have said that we need to have the next generations of our children be engaged in a war on terror. It's the defining event, and it, basically, it's the new version of the Cold War, the Orwellian way of controlling people that elites use by using wars and fear to, for social control. The Cold War ended. And they had to come up with, with something to play the same strategic purpose. And they eventually, it took about 10 years, arrived at, I think, a consensus, as I said, from Bill Moyers to George Bush, that it's going to be a war on terror. Let him go. Okay. Um, you know, I, I guess my question would be, uh, where did they meet? In a treehouse or something like that? You know, I'm serious. Where did they meet? How did they do it? The problem you have, the problem with that thesis is, it provides, it suggests a collectivist, a collective notion that simply isn't there. I can give you, I can make an argument, counter-argument, but anyway, look, I, I, I'm, I'm glad you said you view it. I, you, you, 
are disagreeing. You think there's basically an enormous conspiracy to get us into a war for reasons that aren't clear. I wish, even so, I even wish that were true. That would be so much better than what we got, pal. What's so bad with, you know, if you want to deal with death doomsday, what's so bad about the one we have? We've got a president that is going to wage war because of an ideology supported by a few people that's not going to change no matter what the ground results are. I mean, I think. What? I'm explaining the anomaly of the Democratic Party and the mass media giving Bush a green light. Duh. How do I explain that the press took a, took a dive on this one? They ran it The Democratic war. Party. The, in other words, the major powers that were supposedly you, sir, being kicked out of... Sir. Sir, let me just say this to you. If there's going to be a social revolution in the United States, the American press corps will not even know about it for six months. <laughs> Let's go. Yes. Can, can you speak to the uh, demise of the moderate Republicans and how this yeah, small group has question. taken over the party? Right. I can tell you what Kerry will do with the moderate Republicans. He's going to put some in his cabinet. I think he's going to do that. And the demise of the modern Republicans is simply the same thing, was the, the same as the, the demise of the, the, the Demo everybody got swept away. I think if you really want to try and explain any collectivism, it's mass fear and paranoia and also a sense of impotence, if you will, and rage after 9-11. Um, after One reason, you know, the prison of brutality. Let me tell you something about it. Remember John Walker Lynn? Mm -hmm. John Walker Lynn was this 20-year-old teenage boy that joined the Taliban that had no idea what he was doing. We now know there's many like him in Guantanamo, never fired a shot against us. Was the, and when they captured him, um, uh, he was strapped to a board naked for four days, five days before they took a bullet out of his legs. They threw him into a hole where they allowed reporters and, and, and in, in Bagram, in the prison outside of uh, Kabul in Afghanistan, and they allowed uh, 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 GIs and even some reporters to spit on him, hurl epithets. Uh, he was locked into a cave for days, literally in a in a, in a converted um, uh, a great sort of a bin. I don't know exactly what it was like. It was like a um, a, um, ammo shed that was cleared, and he was locked in there with no light and little peepholes, and guys could go and scream at him. And I am telling you, there were some people who thought, "Wow, this kind of a treatment is really going to get the American people upset." It was all done in the open. Wham! We went for it, hook, line, and sinker. Good. So that was it. And that's where you don't, that's the real tragedy of the Bush administration. It was that point we needed moral leadership. At that point, we needed a president to say, we do not treat human beings this way. We cannot do, and none of us, we all were guilty of that one. His lawyer, his, his lawyer, Brosnan, a very tough Jim Brosnan, eventually settled for a 20-year cop-out plea because he was afraid what would happen if he went to trial. And we now know what, uh, how many, what, 1,200 people arrested, how many convictions? We know, we know. So it wasn't, you know, are they dumb, the Bush people? 9-11 um, happens, do they declare war on, on American citizens, on the white middle class or upper middle class? No. They go on, they play the xenophobia card. They go after the Muslims. They go after anybody without a visa, anybody who's not a citizen with a green card. They go after, they make it almost impossible to come into the country. They leave us alone. They're not dumb. Only two Americans were arrested, Padua and the other fellow who was sent back recently to Saudi Arabia. And I will tell you right now what I know. I haven't written this for the New Yorker, so you have to, it's not, it's, the, the Hamdi, Hamdi's calling card was the one who was captured for three years, stayed on the ship for years, that ended up uh, in Guantanamo for a little while. Hamdi's calling card was in a trial he was going to say what, what they did to him in those three years. He was going to testify about the torture. And I will tell you something about Guantanamo. When we're done, with knowing what happened in Guantanamo in the name of all of us. We're, it's going to be the equivalent of, a, of, a, of, the, of that Andersonville, that incredible Civil War prison that the North ran in Georgia, I think it was, in, in the early and after, in the middle of the war, where it was a, a, an absolute murder camp. And, uh, um, these guys, these guys defined torture as this narrowly. You have to get this. Torture is only the causing of pain severe enough to cause organ damage or possibly death. That's torture, which means that anything else is okay. Anything, that's the way they defined it. And they did it unilaterally. They broke faith with, 
with everything America stood for. We have so much to go after them for. And if you talk about collectivism, the fact that none of us in the press in the, in the press in the first year or two did this, they're doing it now. Good stories now, but boy, they sure weren't there when they needed them. Let's go. We'll do. We'll finish to this crowd. I, I don't want to. We can't go past eight, right? It's about, you got you're, minutes. you're my boss. Let's go. Shoot. Okay. It's it's hard to follow that. Um, I want to ask a question that comes up all the time among the community of people who work on Israeli-Palestinian issues. Um, is it possible that the ne the primary motivation for some of the neocons is different from the primary motiv motivation of Bush, as you've laid, you've laid it out, particularly, of course, with Wolfowitz, Pearl, Douglas, Faith, and I don't know who else you're including in your eight, but if I heard all the names, I could give you some others, um, whether, given their history and what, the, what they've done over many, many years, whether um, perceived support for Israel isn't the primary motivation for those people, whether or not it is for Bush. Well, we don't know. Um, you know, uh, somebody, I was asked by some reporter somewhere, if there was one person alive or dead you could interview, who would it be? And I said, George Bush, of course, because I'd love to know, assuming he'd answer honestly. You know, I read, I said this earlier, I read the Woodward book, the first one on, on, on Plan for War, which I found, let me say something about this. Woodward doesn't get it wrong. I, I, I wouldn't do what he does, but it's very valuable. He's done a book in which um, uh, from 9-11 from to March, uh, 18 months, he describes the buildup from the war from inside with documents and all the meetings. He's privy to all sorts of amazing stuff that as journalists we never see. The notes of various meetings, I'm sure they're sanitized up to a point, but he really got incredible access. And I was saying earlier tonight upstairs uh, that uh, I'm, I, one of the mystery writers I read is a guy named Mankell, uh, is a, a, a Swede, and it's one of those mysteries where, M-A-N-K-E-L-L, -L, you know, it's a 50-year-old depressed alcoholic Swedish cop. And you've all read those, seen, you've seen the movies. Anyway, but it's interesting because always at a critical moment, he, there's a scene, and most of the book is said with him saying, there's something in this scene that I know is important, but I don't know what it was. And so when I, after, for about a year after reading that book, months after the book, there was something in it, and it finally dawned on me what it was. Here's three or four hundred pages of the internal deliberations, and at no time does Cheney or Wolfowitz or Rumsfeld say in a staff meeting, uh, say, uh, what's with this uh, Muslim stuff? And uh, can somebody give me a, a short paper, you know, three pages or more on, on this Koran? Uh, what is it? The view in the White House was they came after us because they want what we have. And that's the view that exists today. So to, for me to begin to try and differentiate, New Cambridge is one of them, a guy named Bill Lutie, a guy named Scooter Libby, a guy named Steve Hadley, are all part of the eight or nine. That, as, as described, a, a guy named David Williams, and many of them are very pro-Israel. Right, very, very pro-Israel. I still think for Bush, the dominant thing, whatever the Israeli issue, the dominant thing that remains is democracy in Iraq, as wacky as it is. But I can't tell you what's in his mind. You could be absolutely right. But I was asking about the people who are advising him. I wasn't asking about him. I was asking about whether for some of them the oh, well, primary motivation no, is I think Israel. I said from the beginning that was the issue, of, certainly in the 90s for Fife and others. It, it was very much about Israel. But, it, you know, it sort of evolved into a, a broader thing after 9-11. And, um, uh, but, you know. Um, uh, um, we don't know. We're not going to know. We should go on. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, so I just thank you very much. Your work is sure, really right. so important. Um, I just want to say about about Clinton because we have to look, you know, not just at Bush about in terms of who right. wants the war and everything. You know, Cl Clinton, a million and a half Iraqis dead, and you know the Iraq Liberation Act. We're going to oust Saddam Hussein. Right. I got point. it. Go you ahead. Know what I'm saying so. We have to look at the Democrats. But um, what's your I, question? I, I, may I get to it? May I okay. just say a little bit? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. I just want to thank Mother Jones so much for especially the. Mike Hoffman, Mike Ho the Mike Hoffman article. It's so important because we have to. But please, my question, my question is about my question is about resistance to the war because I know no matter who, get, who no matter who gets elected, it's going to be a pro-war candidate, and we're going to have to resist if we want the war to end. It's going to be so key that the um, the soldiers themselves start to resist, just like in Vietnam. But go ahead. ahead. What's so your my, question, my question is, what, what do you think? I'm, I'm curious if you know about the, like the consciousness of the soldiers right now and whether they're resisting if you've done any work about you know what 
Okay. What their anti-war sentiment is. And okay, I, I can tell you right now, the, the families certainly are. There's a growing family movement that's very powerful. They're growing at 30 to 40 families a week. The uh, mothers and others are very amazing people. I've seen them talk. And that's a very powerful group that's going to be more and more outspoken. I, I can't tell you, soldiers are under tremendous strain because they're soldiers. And there's a lot of pressure. And um, so, um, uh, and, you know, yeah, Clinton did a lot of stuff. I, I always have... I always have this thing about Clinton because the one nice thing about Bill Clinton that always impressed me was he was the first president since World War II to actually bomb white people. And that always impressed me. You know? That always impressed me. That's pretty good. Let's go on. Next question. Well, you know, it gets to the issue, are we perhaps a racist society? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I write military history and at one time we had the same editor. Who's that? Bob Loomis. Oh yeah. Anyway, I, I was I was opposed to to the war, you know, f f before it began, because I could see only two outcomes: it either ends with an American withdrawal or it ends with an American expulsion. If there is an uprising, are the people you know planning to use the traditional counter to an uprising? which is massacres. Which is? Massacres. The way you use the, you know, the way that Saddam dealt with the Shiite uprising, the way that colonial occupiers have dealt with uprisings for thousands of years, as you just have a bloodbath. Uh, the people you know in the Pentagon right. anticipating an uprising, and if they are, uh, they, I don't. I don't know. They're going to have plans for I don't know. I, I, your tense may be wrong. If Lancet's right, we've killed a hundred thousand Iraqis. I don't know what you call that. No, I'm talking about killing thirty thousand in a day oh, on well. television. I, look, I'm, you know, I, I hear you, and it's you know, it gets me on edge too. But I, I you know, it, it takes it's a lot of energy to kill. Um, look, I don't know. Helicopter gunships. Um, A1, A1 well, we're talking, I, I've been talking about increased bombing. I think the bombing, but anyway, I, 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 you know, I, I don't know what you can get away with. I don't think, you know, right now it's tough. Overt massacres, I, I would think. I think we're going to have the massacres and then the withdrawal because people will not tolerate it. Well, see, it's interesting, man. Some guy even darker thoughts than I have. Yes, let's go. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, I certainly agree with your analysis about the ideological, even messianic, motivation right. for going to war in Iraq. But I also wonder if you could comment on, you should pardon the expression, psychological motivation. Here's this perpetual screw-up of a firstborn son who finally sets out to not even get his father's respect, because it's not clear he's getting that at all, but to do one better and finally show him up for good. How much of a part do you think that played? in his decision to go to war. Let's do better. Let's go back to Hershey's war lover. Maybe it's sexual. <laughs> Maybe he gets off on it. You know, who knows? Uh, you know. Well, what I can tell you is that it's, it's also very possible that it is very possible, and I've seen some anecdotal stuff about it, that even before he was elected, he wanted to go to Iraq. And he may, he may secretly have been much more intellectually in tune with these people for before it began. And that's why he was so receptive to it. This is possible. We, don't, we didn't see it because he didn't sign anything or do anything. But some of the people, for example, just to give an idea, uh, Richard Armitage, who ends up working for Powell, uh, the Deputy Secretary of State, was signing all the papers about Iraq in the, in the 90s. And when he got into office, I will tell you right now, he is a true hero. He and Powell, as much as we all can say what we want about Powell, I think Powell has to feel full of self hatred in a way that my guess is he's got to really feel strange about himself but Armitage I can tell you fought cats and dogs against these guys on the inside although he had signed a lot of papers beforehand so it's awfully hard to know what, what it was I mean, you know it could be he wanted to do it all along and do you remember the war lover with John Hershey book it's a great novel anyway it's it's it's, look it, it's look it up the other book to read, if yes. you want to read about Anderson, a guy named McKinley Cantor, I date myself, he wrote a book about Anderson, one of the great books of all time, a novel. Yes, sir. Yes, I think you're relying a little too much on what I would call a, a bad guy theory of history. I don't think there was a conspiracy involved in, in all this uh, around Iraq that, 
essentially there was a broad consensus among many, many people to go to war with Iraq. And regime change certainly was a perspective that was shared by many, many people. And it was something that was out in the open that, you know, many people could read about and study and debate and argue about long before March of 2003. I tend to think that it was a major policy goal of not only the Bush administration, but of the Clinton administration. You mean to go physically to war with him? No, to the goal of regime change and to control the oil and dominate the politics and the economy of the Middle East. It's essentially a strategic perspective, I think, that was held by both sides of the aisle. And, you know, it had nothing to do with a conspiracy at all or a, you know, a theory of bad guys kind of ruining the policy of this country. If you could respond to that. Well, I thought it was more like a wet dream, to be honest. You know, I mean, that the idea of ruling the Middle East and controlling the oil. The only problem with that thinking is this. Um, one of the things that's amazing is a lot of people think there was unanimity about the WMD. It was a classic mistake that there was WMD. Everybody believed it. It was a commonly held notion that, and the whole government was fooled. I can tell you the number of people inside the American government who knew there were no weapons there and articulated it were staggering. Most of the State Department Intelligence Bureau was adamant there was no, no nuclear or chemical weapons there. They were worried about possibility maybe of some biological, but certainly no nuclear. The Department of Energy has a very good intelligence apparatus, Sandia, Livermore Labs. They were absolutely categorical, no nukes there. The United Nations inspection team was categorical, no nukes. The International Atomic Energy Agency produced a report in 1997 that was categorical as far as these agents can be. Unlikely, without a doubt, they said perhaps. It was just one little caveat. You always have more than that in these reports, saying no nuclear stuff there. So the idea that um, that everybody shared some sort of common perception. I, I, I think this was ramrod by a bunch of people who, who terrorized the press, uh, overcame the Congress, which is my take on Congress is real simple. Since I've been around 40 years, the average IQ of a senator has gone down 20 points. And I was just not as smart as it used to be. Overran the Congress. Uh, muffled the liberals who had nothing to say. They were trying. Kennedy, particularly the fellow uh, Byrd, Byrd. We didn't have people standing up in Congress like he used to. And I think, I think they simply overran everybody. And I think the press, and to some degree, many of the press, wanted the war. But I, I, I don't see that as, as carrying out some sort of mantra that Clinton wanted to, because I, I, it would have been almost impossible for Clinton to attempt to do something like this. You know who would have been against it? Um, all of the conservative people who were for it when Bush was in. Let's, let's do a couple more questions. But it's, you know, look, I hear what you say, and it's not irrational, and you could be right. I'm, I'm not proffering any answers. I'm just proffering what I see. And it doesn't make it right. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, in my opinion, one of the scariest things about what's going on right now is the number of American people that still support Bush and that are with him in this crazy like view. I mean, no, I mean, I'm, I almost wish I were, but I'm not. But my question is, what connection do you think that there is behind these, this huge amount of support and the rise of certain um, very conservative religious movements in our country? Because I feel, in my opinion, like there's this <clears throat> messianic ideology and that that's, well, I, I just well, actually I don't know why. I get your gift. Well, somebody said the number of people who do not believe in evolution in America is roughly around 70 million. And that's his hardcore constituency. And I noticed I was very interested in the third debate, uh, just sort of heuristically as looking at it. Bush went back to his base on the third debate. He went back, to, he went back on abortion, he went back on stem cell, he went back to a lot of very hardline stuff. And I wonder what they were seeing in the polls that made him go back to his base. It was interesting. They were seeing something that moved him back right to the hardcore. He's going to rely on those, those, that 48 or 47 percent he's got. And they're going to vote for him. And the question is, what else happens? Um, whether that they're going to be overrun by, by uh, the four, they, they poll at 48 now, but if many more people, 30 million more people vote, that's going to change everything, even 20 or even 10 more. Um, but uh, as, I, I just, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough issue. I, I, I don't know what to tell you about about Bush. Tell me, well, ask me the question you want to ask me. Well, that was it, actually. Just that... Um in my, like, I can't explain to other people from other but countries. Just tell me, make it no. a question. Okay. Um, 
Why are they supporting Bush? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> where is okay. that coming from? Um, but you know there was a public opinion poll that showed that, uh, uh, as opposed to the rest of the nation, the people who say they're for Bush, um, upwards of 60% of them said, this was just done in the last few weeks, said that they also um, um, believe that Saddam was behind 9-11 and also involved with Al-Qaeda. So when you have this kind of disparity, even despite what the facts are, what you have is a lot of people who I think for them to accept the reality that maybe they were wrong about that premise yeah. would be somehow to break the faith. Is that a religious thing? Maybe it is in some case. Uh, it, it's an impossible question to answer because we're dealing with such a large scale. Uh, but they're there. They're locked into them. And they really think that he's made us safer. And I don't know what we can... It's probably a failure of all of us in the media that, that so many people have been led to think so long that he was a savior. But let's do three, four more questions and we'll... Oh, just one, one more question. I'm okay. sorry. Would you sorry. comment on Colin Powell? I thought he was our only hope in this administration. The what? On Powell. I thought he was our only hope. Well, he, you know, he, he's, he still has a higher public opinion rating, but I think he's a very sad man. And we'll do it real quick. Real quick. Come on. Quick. Real quick. Um, this week on Salon.com, someone wrote in and said, you know, if Bush wins again, I'm going to move to Canada. And the editor said, you can't. You have to stay here and fight the good fight. I was wondering, knowing what you know, knowing who you know, in your opinion, beyond reading your articles and being involved and being informed, how can we stay here and fight the good fight? Oh, well. Just keep on keep We have no choice. Right. We have no choice. That's all. Yes. Um, you keep mentioning that Bush has gone, I mean, he's just obsessed with um, creating democracy in Iraq. You haven't said anything about the program for a new American century, which talks about taking over the whole world. Isn't that a part of what they're after in the long run? Oh, well, let's just start with Iraq for now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, last question. Um, do you have any idea as to why Tony Blair has supported the war? Oh, I think, he's, I think it's the same sort of faith-based initiative. Uh, I think he's truly, a, he sees this as a moral issue, which is astonishing. I'll tell you one thing about Blair. I've seen a lot of stuff. Obviously, I'm, I'm, I, I collect a lot of stuff. And I'll say one thing about Blair. The critical moment came in early 2002, in February, March, when there was a meeting down in Crawford, Texas. Blair did get papers from his people. And... They did get papers that said the following. Well, here's the problem. He wants to go, Mr. 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 Prime Minister, and, you know, we're in. The problem is there's no evidence about WMD. There's no evidence of a link to Al-Qaeda, and it's probably illegal to do what he wants to do in terms of the UN resolutions. Therefore, our j and then the solution, and very a wonderful British understatement, we'll have a lot of work to do to persuade the British people that this is the right thing to do. It was the suggestion of not doing it wasn't even on the table. We're going to go. It's almost an amazing phenomenon. There's, but, you know, um, I, if he loses, I really, I'm, I, I swear, I promise you, if he loses, I'm going to spend years trying to figure out what happened. If he loses, if he wins, I've got to keep on doing the awful stuff I hate doing right now. I can't stand working against these guys. It's just no fun. This is no fun. You, our business, my business is fun. It's a lot of fun. These guys aren't fun. They're not fun. They're too dangerous. Goodbye, folks.